Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back, we're live, we're talking about history today. I'm Jay Fidel, this is Think Tech, and more specifically, this is History Lens. History Lens, yes. And that's John Davidan. He's yes. a history professor at Hawaii, yes. Public, uh, Hawaii Pacific University. Yes, right. <clears throat> so, um, what about History Lens, John? What do we mean by that? Right, so essentially what I want us to do is I want us to look at contemporary events, current events, through the lens of history. So, uh, taking, uh, for instance, what we're going to talk about today, this poll in 2011 that showed that more Americans believed that states' rights was the cause of the Civil War than believed that slavery was the cause of the Civil War. And you can see the poll right there. Mm -hmm. uh, and sure enough, there it is. It's a Pew Research poll. And uh, so, I, you know, this is, this is uh, wrong. This is a mis. Uh, misperception about the past and so I want to be able to inform the present with interesting and accurate and accurate interpretation. How did of the it past. get that way? I mean you know there's been when I, when I went to high school yeah. and college there were Civil War buffs all around me. Right. They right, lived for it. They, right, they studied right, every little detail right. of it. It was I don't know what it was. It was that generation, my generation. Well it's it's, so, so the, the, the reinterpreting of the Civil War to emphasize state rights and to de-emphasize slavery is actually a century-long process that begins in the 1870s and the 1880s with uh, the memoirs of, of Southern generals and other Confederates who did not want to talk about the slavery issue. Ah. which was indeed the central issue of the war. But they were uncomfortable with this because slavery had been abolished and it was an embarrassment. And it's like, okay, the, the, the norm of, of the Amer American nation had changed. Uh, slavery was no longer acceptable. Are there, are there so, two levels here? I mean, one level is, yeah, we had a big problem. And it was getting worse, yeah. as we, you and I talked about it last time. Was right. Under the hood, this was uh, irreconcilable. Right. You couldn't have a country with some slave, states through slavery and others. In fact, yeah. you couldn't have a country with slavery in general in, in the 19th century. It was impossible. Um, but the other thing is that um, the way it presented uh, through the years, and certainly in 1861, was does a state have the right to secede from the Union. How strong is the Union? How strong is the United States? Could we prevent the state from just backing out of the deal? Right, right. So that's, that's a debate that's going on, and that's certainly there in 1861. I'm not denying that. Um, and of course, that's a debate that happens because Jefferson makes this argument in the, in the Kentucky Resolutions about this, the Union as a voluntary compact. But right. this is uh, this is widely refuted by 1861 by many politicians, including Lincoln, who says, no, no, this is actually an inviolable union of the American people. doesn't have anything to do with individual states. It's a union of the American people. So uh, Lincoln's interpretation is completely different. But uh, so the states' rights is there. But the, the thing is, the question of that time is not willy-nilly should the South secede. From the Union. It's, it's, South has no intention of seceding from the Union just because they feel like it or they don't like the North. Uh, the Confederate states want to secede from the Union because the Union is threatening their institution, the peculiar institution, the institution of slavery. Mm. Um, so I th that's... You no, know, I'm just remembering something. Yeah. They use the term to refer to the South and the organization of states in the South as the Confederacy. But wasn't there, before the United States was established, yeah. before, what, 1789 and all that, there was the Confederate States of America, wasn't there? Well, there, there? Were, there were the Articles of Confederation. Articles which, of Confederation, which, is, yeah. which was an absolute disaster. Yes, right, didn't right, work. Right. But, yeah, but so. it's funny they should use the same term as had been used <laughs> earlier, which didn't work. Right, but what the South wanted was a confederation of states. They felt like this would protect their institution the best. They didn't even want a national government telling them what to do. Uh, and, and that was actually a, a grave shortcoming of the Confederacy because they couldn't fight the war unless they agreed how to fight the war and you know under which command the troops should be, and they couldn't agree on this. So, uh, so the, yeah, the states' rights issue is definitely there. But again, if we go back and we look at the 1850s, the, the, the decade that precedes the Civil War, then we will see an explosion. And it's not an explosion about states' rights. It's actually an explosion about slavery. 
And it's really, it's slavery in the new territories. The question of not the not the existing states. But well, that that comes into play too later in the in the 1850s. But initially, it's a question of what to do about these new territories that that the United States had gotten in the war with Mexico. So, how do you deal with this? Should they be slave or free? Who gets to decide that? How is it decided? All of these but questions the had to be answered. What's the difference? Depend, you know, of course, somebody has to decide, but suppose I, I take state X, or about to be state X, right. and I say, well, is it slave state or not? What, what difference does that have to the union, I mean, to the whole country? Right, right. So if you get, uh, uh, if, if a slave state is admitted to the union, that gives uh, two more senators on the side of slavery. So there's this pitch battle being fought. Congressional representation and representation in the Senate will be changed dramatically by whether or not these new territories are free or slave states. Ah, so so a, a slave state would be more likely to side with existing slave states. Without a doubt. And there would be the slave state block. So the people in the slave states wanted to expand that block because they would have more power in Congress? Exactly, exactly. So that's the, that's the uh, kind of the drumbeat after the war with Mexico is what's going to happen with these territories and who's going to get power out of it because by this time period uh, slavery is a very controversial issue abolitionism is, in the north is very strong the slaves are demonstrating uh, uh, pardon me the slaveholders are demonstrating a very strong defense of, of slavery uh, so there's these there's these the battle sides are set why did it become such a controversial issue it had existed, you know, for hundreds of years right, before that. Right, right, that's true. Why now? What was happening that made it well, controversial? I, I, I suppose you could look to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is a time period in which, uh, you know, uh, European intellectuals are saying, you know what, uh, freedom and liberty are these concepts that are sacred. Uh, and you see this uh, reflected in the American Declaration of Independence. And uh, so, so a lot of things that were assumed to be okay in 1500, 1600, were absolutely not okay by 1700 and 1800 because of this idea about humans, about uh, the, the equality and the liberty of humans that came out of the Enlightenment time period. So, yeah, yeah I think that's why. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. how you're a history professor. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you, you, you see something happening right now and, and you accept that because that's now. Right. And you, and you look through the lens of history backward yes, right. to where people you know, took a different position entirely, yes, yes. and you rejudge that period of yeah, time. You can. And yeah. you say, that's not acceptable. For example, right. Mark Twain, I don't know if you saw this recently, Mark Twain, there's a school somewhere in the Midwest where they want to take all the Mark Twain books out oh. <laughs> because Mark Twain referred to the, to the African Americans under oh. the N word oh, yeah, multiple yeah. times, yes. hundreds of times yes, yes. in some of his books. Yeah. And the people in you know in the school and, and outside the school who care about that issue, right. um, you know, are demanding that those books be removed, and apparently they will be removed. Oh, what really? I find interesting yeah. is that Mark Twain, for whatever you know his his, his vocabulary, uh, was a great piece of American history. Oh yes. Now we yes. judge him yes. retrospectively. Yes, yeah, but of course Twain was writing uh, in the time of the Civil War. He didn't serve in the Civil War. He went out to the West actually, so he could escape he the came war. Came to Hawaii. That's right. <laughs> but so he's writing in that time, and some of his stuff is is uh, racist. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, so uh, you know, this is a diff that's a different question. The question of how we have changed our interpretation of, of the Civil War is reflected in this debate about uh, Civil War statues, what we should do about them, how to treat Civil War heroes. Uh, should they be heroes? Should they be considered traitors? That's definitely, you know, something that has become top burner in, yeah, in yeah. Uh, American society. But it goes to this point about controversy. So in 18, say 1850, I'm not sure that's the that's exact year. That's exactly the date, Jay. So 1850, you look back on the, const on the days of the Constitution, right, right. you say, you know, those guys accepted slavery back then. I mean, they didn't right. make a big deal about right. it in the Constitution. It was, it was, uh, it was the status quo. Yeah. They didn't argue. I mean, they accepted it. So now 1850, we're looking back. Yes. We're looking at the mores of 1850, and we're rejudging 
what happened at the right, time of the Constitution. Right, right. So, yeah. I was saying that it was flawed in that way. Well, it was, it was a, a new way of looking at slavery, certainly by the 1830s. But by, the, by 1850, then, the battle lines were set. Northern, many Northerners were anti-slavery for a variety of reasons, not just abolitionists. And the South was solidly behind the institution of slavery, with the exception of a, two, of a few progressives who uh, who still who believed that uh, slavery was evil, slavery was maybe even a sin. Mm -hmm. So, so the battle lines are set, uh, and uh, the president Zachary Taylor, who was a war hero, was not much of a politician. He actually he was a slaveholder himself, but he sided with the North after the Mexican War in this debate about what to do about the new territories. And sure enough, he got himself into deep political trouble. And so in 1850, there was a real crisis about what to do, like there was in 1819 with the Missouri crisis and the Missouri Compromise when Missouri came into the Union. And so what do we do, the American politicians and people said, what do we do? And truth is, before the Compromise of 1850, Southerners were planning a convention that summer to consider secession. Huh. So it wasn't and that's just fully 11 years before, yes, 12 yeah, that's years correct, before the that's Civil correct. War. So if we can bring up the Compromise of 1850 map. So uh, some famous American politicians step in. Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, and John C. Calhoun, who, by the way, are all dotering in their, their old age. Uh, the two of them die shortly after the Compromise is completed. And they come on to the Senate floor and they give speeches, impassioned speeches about the Union and about compromising. So the, the compromise of 1850 is the result of compromise. And if you can bring the map up again then, so the, the map shows this compromise, which was worked out in Congress, and so you can see that the territories, the new territories, California's gonna come in free, Utah and New Mexico Territory are coming in with popular sovereignty. The people of those states decide. Slavery. That's okay. correct. They decide. And then you have the abolition of the slave trade in Washington, D.C. And then, and probably most importantly, you have a new fugitive slave law. So that's good in terms of the, we don't need to look at the map anymore. But uh, so this new fugitive slave law, uh, law is, is, is key because the new fugitive slave law is a very strict law. It allows you uh, slave owners to go back and get slaves who had escaped long, long ago. Slaves from the 1830s now were uh, in fear for their lives because they were going to be brought back to slavery. If they had uh, fled to the north, the slave owner could come to the north exactly. and get them? Exactly, the slaveholder, slaveholder hired slave catchers, uh, the slave catchers would ride north and they would pick up people. Sometimes they picked up people who had, who had simply forgotten their manumission papers at home. And they picked up people, in other words, who were legitimate, legitimately and lawfully free. There was no trial for this. There was simply a judge who got paid $10 if he ruled in favor of the slave owner and $5 if he ruled in favor oh, of the escaped slave. I think I know slave. how he would rule. <laughs> What's manumission? Mean? Manumission is simply freedom. And uh, they were freedom. doing that. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Some slave owners decided they didn't want, they, they felt badly about it, and they would manumit their slaves, or some slaves could actually buy their freedom if they earned enough money. Uh, so these kinds of things happened. Uh, so, and yeah, and in the, uh, the slave who was free then, even in the North, in the, by the 1850s then, with this new law, would want to carry his papers, because if not, the slave catcher could come and bring right, them back Right, whether he slavery. was manumitted or not. Exactly. So what about somebody in the North who would, um, who would protect um, and give, uh, give comfort uh, to an escaped slave? Would he be subject to this federal law? Uh, as um, part of this compromise? Yeah, actually, yes. There, there were prosecutions against people who were uh, harbor, harboring fugitive slaves, yeah. That's so you had to be very careful. The 1850s was a time period when it was locked down for escaped slaves. And uh, this fugitive slave law turned many Northerners who had been what we call compromise unionists mm. in the spirit of the Compromise of 1850 into uh, Activists. Stark, mad abolitionists. It would be. I mean, this sounds like Germany in, 18, in 1939. It was awful, it's, on a moral level, awful. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so, so what you have then is the dramatic growth of abolitionism in the North because of the, because of the fugitive slave yeah. law. Well, uh, we, we're going to take a break on that note. 
Uh, and when we come back, this is John David Dan, he's a history yeah. professor at Hawaii Pacific University. We're talking about the Civil War, the causes, part two. When we come back, we're gonna tell you what this graphic is that we're using as a background <laughs> right, today. Is. Yes. <laughs> You're probably curious. We'll be right back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dave Stevens, the uh, host of Cyber Underground, uh, every Friday here at 1 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. And then every episode is uploaded to the Cyber Underground, that library of shows that you can see of mine on youtube.com. And uh, I hope you'll join us here every Friday. We have some topical discussions about why security matters and what could scare the absolute bejesus out of you if you just try to watch my show all the way through. Hope to see you next time on the Cyber Underground. Stay safe. Nothing is making sense for me and you. We're going to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. A little better. Try a little more, more than every more. Let's do what we Such an interesting discussion, John. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. <laughs> and then uh, I must say that the Pew uh, uh, poll yeah. is so interesting because yeah. this is, happens in 2011, which is, right. you know, how many years after? Right. And right. Uh, it, it's not that these people were alive at the time or they were right. there, they could right. observe. It's, it's a sort of a, an American collective culture thing. Yeah. And, and yeah. since school districts are um, all around the country and they're different, they're managed differently, yeah. textbooks are not the same. Yeah. Teachers is not the same. I think so. So yeah. it's really a yeah. poll of what the teachers were teaching people well, about what happened in the Civil War. Right. So there were other polls that were taken that have been taken since then that, that measure this in the North and in the South. And sure enough, there is a difference between oh, the North yeah, and the South yeah. about how they think about the causes of the Civil War. Yeah. Because even after the hundred years, after the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s, when we no longer considered states' rights to be the central uh, cause of the Civil War. We considered now slavery to be the central cause of the Civil War because, quite frankly, historians gathered data which showed that slavery was, in fact, the central issue of the 1850s. Even after that, you had schools in the South still teaching the states' rights, resisting that, uh, resisting this new narrative and still teaching states' rights as the central cause yeah. of the Civil but War. But slavery is core in the history of this country? It is cool. Civil War and slavery still relevant. It is. It, it is. Was, That's uh, right. You know, it was something that affected us right down to the DNA. Yeah. It still does. Yeah. 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 So, so you want to tell us? Yeah. Uh, so what right. That, let's, what bring, that let's bring. Let's bring. Yeah. This graphic. So this is. You know, just before Warren, this is pretty. Uh, uh, can Can you shrink it down? Yeah. This is a a, a vicious beating that uh, Senator Charles Sumner took on the floor of the Senate in 1857. Shortly after, a very important Supreme Court was ruled in favor of slavery, in favor of the slaveholders. Then uh, Charles Sumner got up and gave this speech, which castigated slaveholders, called them a slaveocracy. Uh, and really, it was, I mean, Sumner was prone to, these, uh, to bombastic language. That's true. But he didn't deserve that. So what happens then is the, the cousin of Senator uh, Andrew Butler of South Carolina uh, comes down out of the gallery, walks into the floor of the Senate, begins to beat Charles Sumner with a cane. <laughs> and uh, other senators from the South who were sympathetic to the caning created a wall so that other senators couldn't stop this. <laughs> Sumner was nearly beat to death. Oh, she was. Yes. And, uh, On the floor of, the, of, of Congress. Yes, it took him three years to recover and to get back. He, he made a full recovery and he came back to the Senate. Uh, and, uh, of course, he's a committed a radical abolitionist. But, uh, but this, is, this is illustrative of the tensions, the tremendous tensions between the North and the South. Polarization. Yes, right. uh, uh, in 1857. Right. Uh, and um, so uh, th there are a variety of things which cause those tensions. Uh, the fugitive slave law is one of them. But then also you have a problem with Kansas. Because, of course, the Compromise of 1850 uh, puts some of the West and some of these new territories in order. But Kansas, the territory of Kansas was what was called Nebraska Territory in that time, was still hanging out there as a territory. It wasn't organized as a state. 
And so uh, Senator Stephen Douglas from Illinois, he wants to run a railroad across the nation. This is in 1854. Uh, and he wants to run it through Illinois because he's from Illinois, right? Sure. He wants to run it through Chicago. Money, yeah. That's right. So, but Southern senators want to run it through the South. So in order to get them to compromise, he says, okay, you, you allow me to run my railroad through Chicago, and in return, I will allow Kansas to come in as a state in which popular sovereignty will decide whether it's slave or free. Uh, Kansas, of course, is just to the west of Missouri, which had been a big fight in, the, in 1820. And so the agreement is struck. Kansas, Kansas is now under popular sovereignty. And um, free soil settlers run, run into Kansas to try to make it a free state. Uh -huh. Slave, Pro-slavery settlers run into Kansas to make it a slave state. There are two constitutions uh, approved. One slave, one free. Oh, wow. There are two capitals, Lawrence and Lecompton. Okay. Uh, and so, so now you have these dueling constitutions that go forward to the national government. And the national government has to decide, what, you, what do we do about this? Well, in the meantime... It's not a question for the courts? It's, it gets, the courts get into it, but honestly, it's the administration mostly that, yeah, yeah. that is recommending does the Congress accept the slave well, It's part of the compromise. That's, that's yeah. right, and, and, uh, and the administrations in this time period uh, are pro-slavery. So they're, they're saying, hey, we're going to accept the pro-slavery pro constitution, and this enrages the, the free soilers in Kansas. There's a lot of violence in Kansas, actually. Uh, another character who we're going to talk about in a minute, John Brown. In fact, you can bring his picture up. John Brown, there's John Brown. You can see, look at his eyes. This is the, these are the eyes of a zealot. He is not a happy candidate. Uh, and he's a zealot for abolitionism. Uh -huh. okay. John Brown takes his sons to Kansas Territory in 1854, uh, and he attacks a settlement of pro-slavery settlers with broadswords, and, and he hacks five settlers to death with essentially machetes. So there's, there's a lot of violence that takes place in Kansas, uh, and Kansas is what we call bleeding Kansas in this time period. So that's another source of that tension which leads to the caning of Charles Sumner. So how uh, is Kansas resolved? Well, eventually Kansas comes in as a free state, but it's only during the Civil War, and it's the uh -huh. Lincoln administration. So, so there, prior to 1861, <laughs> it was unresolved. That's correct, yes. So uh, it's it was really just, interesting it was where, just, where you take a given territory and carve it up this way. It almost sounds like uh, the territories in Eastern Europe being carved up after yes, World War II. Yes, I mean, that's right. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, the, 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 this is the central question. The central question is what's going to happen with these territories, and it blows up. Yeah, and the so compromise of 1850. The compromise did not of eight, work. it did. It worked for a few years, and then it blew up yeah. in the faces of Congress. And uh, uh, they had to figure out uh, what are we going to do. And then there's a court ruling that says that slaves can be taken anywhere in the country. The Supreme Court is uh, composed mostly pro-slavery uh, justices, and they rule. And that's what causes the caning of of Charles Sumner, because Sumner denounces this. Uh, and by that time, the Congress, uh, congressmen bring their pistols into the chambers <laughs> no, for self-protection. I am not kidding you. <laughs> the country was coming apart, literally coming <laughs> yes, apart. Yeah, I think that's why we had a civil war. So. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so, um, so this reaches its pinnacle in 1859. In 1859, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, is, is he's beginning to do a run for the presidency. He's planning on doing a run for the presidency. In 1859, Dred, the Dred Scott decision, this is this decision before the Supreme Court, the Dred Scott decision has said that slaves can be brought anywhere in the nation. That means potentially that, that states that were formerly free states now can become slave states. So the North is very upset about this. The South is feeling celebratory. John Brown steps into this, and John Brown thinks, I'm going to resolve this issue on my own. I'm going to, I'm going to cause, I'm going to foment a slave rebellion. He, he, he plans an attack on Harper's Ferry, which is a federal arsenal. 
And Harpers Ferry is an important place because it lies at the junction of two important rivers and there are railroads that have junctions there. And, and uh, so his thought was that if I free the slaves in Harpers Ferry, in which is Western Virginia, then that slave rebellion will spread along the Appalachia, the ridge of the Appalachian Mountains and slavery will be defeated. Well, it was a crazy idea. But John Brown was full of crazy ideas. So he goes ahead and he does it. He gathers his sons with him. Frederick Douglass was invited along. Frederick Douglass says, no, it sounds like a crazy idea. I'm not going to go along with it. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a really crazy this stuff. This really helps you understand the nature of the times. Right, that's right. That the, would the, take a risk the like this. fierceness of yeah. John Brown is just unequaled. So, so Brown takes his sons and a few others and... Indeed, he gets, he, uh, he invades the, or attacks the arsenal there, and it's very poorly guarded, so he's able to take it over for a few hours, uh, and then eventually is captured, and most of his crew is killed. Uh, uh, Robert E. Lee is the commanding officer who rides into Harper's Ferry with troops to captures, put, yeah. put down this rebellion and capture John Brown. So John Brown is captured, and he is sent to the gallows. He's convicted and sent to the convicted of treason and sent to the gallows. And on his way to the gallows, he hands a note to his executioner. And the note says, uh, "This nation will be bathed in blood until slavery is dead." Whoa! And yeah, that and got that's published. A, that's like a paraphrase. Hither and yon. Oh yes. The northern press must that's, have taken that correct. everywhere. Yeah. So how did everyone react to John Brown? Well. Uh, Southerners were appalled at John Brown. Some believed that he was a zealot, and some believed that there were lots of John Browns in the North, that maybe Abraham Lincoln was an ally of John Brown. So it really frightened the South. If, if, their, if their homes and their sanctity is, is not safe from the depredations of slaves and slave rebellions, then what is safe? Uh, and so, and Abra but Abraham Lincoln uh, immediately denies any connection to John Brown and says, look, I'm, I'm a moderate. John Brown's not, doesn't belong to the Republican Party. Uh, he's a zealot, he's, he's kind of a crazy person. So Abraham Lincoln said, no, 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 he's, it's not a part of me. There are others, there are abolitionists who say, you know what, John Brown did a good thing. So this is further polarizing the country. Oh, absolutely. And then in 1860, there's the election well, in which Lincoln wins. But before 1860, immediately after John Brown is executed, Southerners begin to mobilize the militia system. This had been a system that was proposed in 1850 during the first thought of secession. So what you have in the South is you have many military academies. Uh, Virginia Military Institute, other Still academies. Do. <laughs> That's correct, and they're very good schools today. But, but so you have all of these military academies, and you have these cadets who are training daily, and the militia system was taking these these young cadets and then adding uh, locals to these cadets to form small armies. Well, this there's this idea there, but it doesn't become uh, operational until after John Brown at Harper's Ferry. So John Brown was really an important polarizing effect, an important uh, uh, stimulant. Well, uh, it's, the, it's a, one could war. say John Brown does more for the Civil War than anyone else yeah, yeah. because the militia system means that the South is, has, the, uh, has the capability of forming an army and is willing to fight and shed blood for its cause, which is the cause of slavery, and the protection of slavery. And, uh, and so what is the North, how is the North yeah. going to respond? So yeah. then, of course, Abraham Lincoln runs, he is elected. His election is, is the center. His election crystallizes all of this. Yeah? Yes, I mean, uh, Lincoln says, look, I'm going to leave slavery where it exists. I only care about slavery in the territories. Yeah. He, he makes this very clear, but honestly, but the South the is not listening. Yeah. Abraham Lincoln is not even on the ballot in most of the states that become a part of the Confederacy. John, we're going to have to leave it there. Yeah. I hope yes. we can continue this <laughs> from this exact point. Yeah. Next time. Well, well, but we did answer the question of the causes of the Civil War. We did. Slavery is the central cause we of did. the Civil War. And here we are on the, the virtual lip of it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, John. You bet, Lovely to talk, to talk to you. Okay.